and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. Amen. All right, here in Genesis chapter number 33, it really picks up right in the middle of the same story and the same subject that we were in last week. There really isn't any transition or shift. He is still in the middle, that's Jacob, in, uh, in the middle of preparations and, and meeting Esau. He's actually going to see his brother face to face, as you saw there. And uh, he is going to get to meet his brother Esau again. Now, I want you to keep in mind the amount of time that has went by since he has seen his brother Esau. And that is at least 20 years. He said that he, hadn't, it's, he, said that he had served Laban. He had been there with Laban for 20 years. Now, you don't know the, the, specifically the amount of time that it took him to travel you know, from Canaan to the land of Nahor or Haran. We're not sure about that. And we also don't know the specific amount of time that it took him to travel from you know, uh, Nahor or Haran back to Canaan. So roughly 20 years is the amount of time. Now I want you to keep in mind, I want you to go back with me. Go to uh, Genesis chapter number 27. Genesis chapter 27. I want you to keep in mind when we read here uh, the story of Jacob getting to meet or reunite with his brother Esau the way in which their relationship was as far as the state in which it was in the last time that they saw one another. So, <clears throat> of course, Jacob stole, unrightfully stole the blessing of Esau, who was the elder. He supplanted him for it and deceived him. And this is the attitude that Esau had about that towards Jacob. Look at verse number 41. It says this in verse number 41 of chapter 27. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, <clears throat> excuse me, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So the very last time that they were together, of course, immediately after this, his mother, Rebecca, Jacob's mother, Rebecca, gives him the advice to flee, to go, you know, go to the land where Laban is located, where her family is from, right? And to hide from Esau because <clears throat> he sought to kill him. Michaela, where's Michaela at? Tell her to get me some water, please. <clears throat> so uh, he sought to kill him. She had overheard this statement, it tells you afterwards. So she's the one that devised the plan. Hey, you need to go with Laban. You need to go until his uh, anger, Esau's that is, until his anger is appeased or his anger is pacified. You need to go away for a period of time. <clears throat> In chapter number 32, we saw the great fear that Jacob had in meeting Esau. And he had heard that there were Esau comes, right, with 400 men. So Jacob was extremely fearful. We heard the, the humility in his prayer to God. We, we heard how when he was instructing his messengers and the droves and the caravans that he was sending to Esau with all of the gifts, the wording that he used referring to Esau as his Lord and he wanted to find grace in his sight. So Jacob has the right attitude here. Jacob knew that when he took the, the blessing, and then, of, of course, before that, the birthright, that he wrongfully did so. That is why he has this attitude right now. He knew that he was in the wrong in what he did. That's why he's repeatedly, and I want to plant this in your mind before we go through the chapter, he's repeatedly asking for grace. Now, in what situation do you need grace? Because you have done something wrong. Why? We're saved what? By grace through faith. What are you asking for? Mercy. You're saying, don't give me what I deserve. That's why he's repeatedly saying, give me grace. Give me mercy. We're going to see that over and over again in this chapter. The humility comes from the, from the fact that Jacob is fearful of Esau, but also he knows that he was in the wrong. That's why he's asking for grace and for mercy. Look at uh, chapter number 33. Verse number one, we're going to jump right into the chapter. It says this, <clears throat> And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel 
and unto the two handmaids. So we saw this attitude in the previous chapter as well where he was strategizing and preparing for the worst, for possibly him to invade and come in and attack them, right? Look at verse number two. <clears throat> and he put the handmaids and their children foremost. That means in the very front, right? So that's Zilpah and Bilhah. And their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. Now why did he do that? Of course it tells us that Rachel, that he loved Rachel, right? And then he looks down upon uh, Leah. We can see that repeatedly. And then you can see him treating his handmaids or his concubines even less. So he's putting them in the front. Why? Because if Esau does attack, that's who they're going to hurt first. So you see, you know, these are his priorities. And again, we can see the dysfunctionality of uh, polygamy, which the Mormons believe in and, and practice. And you may think that's crazy, but People throughout history have practiced in polygamy and believed in polygamy and thought that the Bible taught polygamy. There are people that have polygamous relationships. That is a relationship where a man is married to multiple wives, but God never commanded that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And God never intended on that. God created man and woman and he says, and they twain shall be one flesh. That was the intention by God when he created man. So we see the dysfunctionality here where he has to choose his wives and which wife he's going to give up or which wife he wants to die first and with the children that, that he had with that woman. So you can see what a terrible, just it really is a disgusting situation when you really get down to it. How he's real willing to sacrifice you know, this wife, and I'm going to make sure I protect this wife, and the children that I had with that woman, you know, I'm going to put them in the front as well. So that's what he's doing so that if Esau does attack, he'll be able to get away with at least Rachel and Joseph. That's the plan. Also, it's interesting that Joseph is mentioned here again. Of course, Joseph's birth is mentioned a few chapters back when he was still in the land with Laban, but Joseph is already mentioned here. Of course, this is Joseph that, that goes down into Egypt uh, later on. <clears throat> Look at verse number 3. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So we do see leadership here in verse number three that once he set all this up and he got close enough to Esau, he did go in the front and he went around and approached his brother first. It says he passed over before them. That means in front of those three groups that he had just named off. Really four groups. <laughs> And then he said, and he says, and bowed himself to the ground seven times. That's a number that we see brought up repeatedly uh, and associated with the Old Testament and the Hebrews, uh, the number seven. Oftentimes that is brought up. Look at what, it, and then it says this, until he came near to his brother. So what he's doing is, he, he, once he can see him, he starts to approach, it, approach him. He goes around all of the groups. And once Esau can see him, he bows himself one time. Walks a little further, I presume, bows himself again, bows himself again until he does it seven times in total before he gets there. What's the reason of that? He wants to show extreme humility. That's why. He wants to show extreme humility. That's why he doesn't just bow one time. Oftentimes when people bow before a king or something along those lines, you know, they'll just bow one time and then get up, right? <clears throat> so why does he do it seven times? He wants to show just excessive humility before Jacob. And we saw the last chapter, as I mentioned already, he was fearful. So there is a genuine, uh, you know, humble heart that Jacob has right now because he is afraid, because he is, he is scared. When you're giving the gospel to people oftentimes at the door, you know, you can see the countenance change when you get to the part of hell, can't you? When you start explaining to them, you know, that there is a, an eternal hell and how it talks about forever and ever... You can see, and you're, and you're showing them the passage about the lake of fire, and then when it clicks and they understand that they deserve to go to hell, sometimes you can see the personality change. And all of a sudden, the person becomes what? Very humble, don't they? Because then they know, like, hey, <clears throat> I could be in danger here. They become afraid of hell, which we should fear God, the Bible teaches. Look there at verse number 4. It says this, <coughs> And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. So I'm sure that there was an extreme moment of relief uh, that went over Jacob at this moment, because he is expecting, obviously, he is, he, you know, he's preparing for the worst, but the way in which he is reacting, it definitely seems like he was expecting the worst to actually occur. He was expecting to be attacked or something along those lines by Esau. So that's why we went back and we looked at isn't that understandable by the situation that took place with Jacob and Esau? Number one and number two, 
the state and the heart that Esau had when Jacob left. So that's the last time he saw his brother. So it would make sense that when he comes back, yeah, <clears throat> Esau's probably wanting to kill him. And then he hears, Esau cometh with 400 men. I mean, why are you bringing 400 men with you, right? That's, I'm sure that's the first thing that popped into his mind. Oh, no, 400 men, right? And I got Rachel, and you know, I'm sure he had a lot of servants as well. But still, I'm sure he was extremely afraid. So this was a, you know, a great moment of relief for him. And this is very comparable to what we read just a few chapters back when Jacob arrived to Haran, or he, he arrived there to uh, Nahor, it's known as both of those names, that particular land. And what happened? Laban saw him, and he knew that he was his brother, and he ran to him, and he fell on his neck, and he kissed him, the Bible said. And what was that? That was a moment where he got to see his brethren. His brother had returned unto him, and there was a moment of happiness. Now, we're going to get into something here in just a minute. That was a little bit of a different story. Because right here, there was a rift in the relationship, wasn't there? There was no rift in the relationship with Laban and Jacob, right? But here, there was a major problem to the point where Esau was literally going to kill his brother. He said in his heart, he wasn't kidding because this is something that he said in his heart. He said that he was going to slay his brother or kill his brother. So look at what happens next. Look at verse number um, <clears throat> 5. <coughs> this is Esau. After he had, he had embraced him and fell on his neck, kissed him and everything, he said he was weeping as well. In verse 5 he says, And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. I mean, that's a pretty cool you know, uh, situation. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, I, you know uh, my brother and I are pretty close. And I can't imagine not seeing him for 20 years. And then I get to see him. And there's like all these you know, women and children. Hopefully there's a woman and then a bunch of children, right? But there's all these women and children, and you're like, who are these? And he's like, these are all, you know, these are all my kids, and this is my wife. Wouldn't that be crazy if you hadn't seen your brother in like many, many years? And he's got like, he's got, you know, just numerous children, 11 children to be exact. And you're like, what in the world? You know, these are your nieces and your nephews. And of course, you know, there's going to be like a, an immediate, like, what would feel to be a strong connection between them. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, uh, uh, the feeling of happiness when he got to see his blood brother that I'm sure he had a great relationship with. And, you know, to some degree, I'm sure he was close, close with to some degree, even if they had, you know, you know, problems because of the birthright thing. I'm sure they had many moments of happiness together when they were young. There was the, the, the feeling of familiarity, you know, of, of just, just loving your, your family, loving your blood, your blood brethren. I'm sure that this was a great moment when he got to see his children and his wives and he hadn't seen them for 20 years. I mean, that would be, I'm sure that would be great. And also at the end there is very important. It says, and he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. How many times have we seen the word grace or graciously come out of Jacob's mouth specifically? Repeatedly. In this chapter, he's going to say it a few more times, and then in the last chapter. Why? Because he's got an extremely humble heart right now. Not only that, if you're able to have children, God's being gracious to you. You know what grace is tied in within the Bible? A gift. You know, child, what children are looked at today as being a burden. Children are looked down upon and people are always asking the question just like, uh, you know, how many more are you going to have? And, you know, uh, you know, don't you know how much those kids cost? Or, you know, all, all different types of silly, silly stuff that they'll say to me. You know, no, you know, I love my children, all of my children, and I don't look at my children like they're a burden. I don't look at my children like they're some kind of problem to me, like they're just like a headache. I love my kids, and the attitude we should have is these are the children which God was gracious enough to give me. These were the children that God gave me, and we should look at it as it's a gift from God, as opposed to looking down upon our children or looking down upon families that have you know, many children. It is a blessing to have kids. Amen. Kids and children are a blessing from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. You know, just a, a theme of the Bible is when you're blessed, what happens? You're going to, you know, you're going to bring forth fruit or the, the trees are going to bring forth fruit or the crops are going to bring forth fruit. You know what you see tied in with that? You, yourself, personally, bringing forth fruit. It is a blessing to have children. We should look at our children like that and be thankful to God and pray to Him and tell Him, hey, thank you, God, for being gracious unto me, for giving me these children. Amen. 
It's not the attitude the world has, that's for sure. Look at verse number 6. It says this, Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, <coughs> and they bowed themselves. That's because they were in the front. So they finally made it there, and it's going to be them that makes it first because he put a space between each group. So the handmaidens, and that's Zilpah and Bilhah, right? That he had children with as well. Those would be his concubines. Look at verse 7. <coughs> And Leah also, with her children, came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. A couple of things. Number one, you can still see that same pattern of how he separated them out in the order that they're arriving to him. And they're also, they have their children, the children that they are the mothers of, right? You can see that. And then at the end there, what did all of them do? Just like Rachel did at the end, it says they bowed themselves. So each group, when they're arriving, what are they doing? They're bowing themselves. I'm sure Jacob <clears throat> instructed them to do so when he, had, when he had split them up and you know, came up with his plan, just like he did. Look at verse 7. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, we read that. Verse 8. <clears throat> and he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? Now that, of course, was the... The, the sheep, the oxen, you know, the goats, all of the, the different uh, uh, groups of animals in the last chapter that he had sent forth. If you remember, he broke them up into all these different groups, uh, and he had a, a basically <clears throat> a steward over each individual group, and he had, hey, just here's one drove coming, and then, you know, uh, Esau would receive however many it was. It was like 200 of one. I can't remember. <clears throat> ewes. So 200 of one. No, 200 she-goats and 200 ewes. So he's getting 200 uh, she-goats that are coming. And then he's, he's getting the, the, the I, I believe, milk uh, cows, was it? Milk camels. Uh, 30 milk camels with their colts. Uh, 40 kinds. So it was 40 cows. So it was 40 kinds. And then 10 bulls. 20 she-asses and 10 foals. So there's numerous different, uh, uh, different livestock that he's sending forth. And it was meant to do what? What does he keep saying? He wants grace. It was meant for him to find grace in the eyes of Esau. Why? Again, because he knew that he had done Esau wrong. He knew what he did to Esau was wrong. That's why he's requesting grace. You only need grace in someone's eyes. It's like mercy. If you never did anything wrong, then you wouldn't need grace or you wouldn't need mercy. So what is he admitting when he's saying, hey... I want to find grace in your eyes. I want to find mercy in your eyes. He's admitting that he had sinned against his brother Esau. He had, he's admitting that he had done Esau wrong. Now, <clears throat> we're going to get more into this, but I want to go ahead and make a statement in relation to that. And it is that when we do our brothers wrong, we should be humble. We should have humility. We should be man enough to go to our brother like Jacob was and to apologize to our brethren. If you do one of your brothers wrong or you do one of your sisters wrong, you need to be man enough to go to them and to apologize to them and to admit that you have done wrong. And a lot of times people feel like or think that they're being a man, especially men of course, that they're being a man by not going. They think they're being a tough guy by not going and apologizing. No, what you're being is a child. That's what you're being. You're being an immature little child who doesn't have enough guts to stand up for what they had done that was wrong. So what you should do is you should go and you should apologize to someone if you've done them wrong. Especially your brother. Especially like in this case here where we see that Jacob did Esau wrong. So what should he have done? He should have went as he did and asked for grace in the eyes of Esau, just like we saw. So <clears throat> we'll get more into that just here in a moment. Look at verse number 9. It says this, And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. So Esau, is, is, he's just saying, I'm fine, man. You don't have to give me these things. You know, keep, keep you know, uh, uh, your own belongings, your own possessions to yourself. Uh, and verse number 10, it says, And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, that's a humble way of saying I ask thee, <clears throat> if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. So what does he mean by that? That when I saw your face, it was just like I had saw the face of God, and God was pleased with me. Let me ask you this question. The moment that you see God... If he is pleased with you, how happy are you going to be? That's exactly what he means. He's saying, he's saying for me right now, he says, 
He said, For therefore I have seen thy face, as though I had seen the face of God. He's saying it was very important to him to see Esau. There's two things tied in here. It was very important to him, and he's happy that he saw him. It was a, it was a, you know, a significant moment, right? He gets to see his brother, and it means something to him. It's very important. It's significant. And he says, And thou was pleased with me, right? He's saying, And he was pleased with me with him. Therefore, he wants to give him this present. He wants to give him <clears throat> these gifts, right? Look there at verse number 11. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. So he pushed him. He tried real hard to get it. He, it was really important that he would take this from him, right? Notice what he says as well. This is also another principle that can, we can learn about our Christianity, about uh, different virtues that we can have. Jacob was blessed mightily, wasn't he? And this was Esau's blessing that he had stolen from him. And that's why he says, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me. Now, what does it mean when God, that God dealt graciously with him, with Jacob? What is grace? It's something that you do not deserve. What did uh, Jacob say in the, very, in the last chapter? Uh, look at verse number... Does anybody remember exactly where it is? It's like verse 10. Yeah, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. That's the definition of grace. Grace and mercy are interchangeable words. It's something that you are not worthy to receive. Just like salvation. Salvation is something that you do not earn or that you do not deserve. The word grace by definition is unmerited favor. That's what the word grace means. The word mercy is unmerited favor. It means something that you do not deserve. And that's why, what, is, what does Jacob say? He says, I am not worthy of, of, of uh, all the uh, mercy and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. He's saying that I don't deserve this, right? I'm not in deserving of this. Then that's why it is grace. That's why it is mercy. And then that's why Jacob is, is asking to receive grace from Esau. Why? Because Esau... Now, I'm not going to say that he, should, he could rightfully kill him, but he did... Esau wrong. There needed to be a recompense, didn't there? Like even in the Bible when someone steals something, there's a recompense. You have to pay back fourfold or, or depending upon what type of uh, livestock it is and things like that. So in order for him not to, <clears throat> to not do anything to him or, or, or not to receive a punishment at all, that would be grace, wouldn't it? He's asking to receive grace in his eyes that he would not try to uh, you know, cause him or, or recompense him for what he had done to him. Just put it that way. But the, the, one of the things I want to focus on here <clears throat> is Esau showing forgiveness to uh, Jacob. Esau being able to forgive Jacob for what he had done. Now, number one, you need to understand the significance of the blessing of God. Jacob now <clears throat> became the progenitor of the Messiah of the entire world. He supplanted and stole the blessing of God upon his own personal life. You know, until that blessing gets passed on, obviously, to the next generation, all the children that he has. You know, while he was alive, Jacob received the blessing, even the physical blessing, upon this earth where God would bless his life. This could have been Esau's. And Jacob stole it from him. I mean, this is extremely significant. Look at the possessions and the things that Jacob had. That would have been Esau's. These would have been Esau's. Look at the great things that came to Jacob throughout his life, the long life that he lived, and all the great things that he received, the children that he had, the great things that they did, and the honorable name that he had. There aren't many other people in the Bible that are more well-known than Israel, the name of Israel, right? That could be, today, could be known as Edom, couldn't it? Because Jacob stole that from him. So you have to understand the significance when you're looking at this situation of what Esau was willing to forgive his brother uh, Jacob for in stealing his uh, blessing from him. So it says, one more time, verse 11, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Then he says, And he urged him, and... He took it. So this is proof, of course, uh, prior to this, he was willing, he had already forgiven him. But this is further proof, and that's why Jacob, I believe, wanted him to take this, uh, because he wanted, to, he wanted everything to be totally resolved. 
He wanted that to be the proof that, hey, everything is completely resolved. Please take this you know, of me and show me that I have found grace in your eyes. That's the point of him um, urging him to receive this of him. Now, like I said, the importance of forgiving your brethren. The importance of forgiving your brethren. I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 17. Luke chapter number 17. We're going to see this taught. You know, uh, in here everyone personally can relate to this very much so. Uh, there, there are people here that have <clears throat> reestablished relationships with others in this area, of another church in this area, um, you know, to some degree. And there are biblical steps in reestablishing relationships. There are biblical steps and steps that you must take in order to make things right. And one of them is, and just like Jesus talked about in the Beatitudes, uh, if you're wrong, you need to go and, and apologize or tell the person that you have done. If you've done someone wrong, a brother, you need to first go make that right. You need to go to him and apologize. Remember when Jesus is talking about, hey, before you offer your gift at the altar, you need to go to your brother and make it right with your brother, right? So one thing is from the perspective of the person that has sinned against their brethren or sinned against their brother, you need to go and you need to tell your brother you are sorry. Or you need to go, like Jacob did, and admit your wrongdoing. You need to, like the Bible's word, repent. You need to change your mind. You need to go to him and tell him, I have done wrong. I have sinned against thee, right? Just like in the, uh, the, the, the story of the, uh, the, the prodigal son. Isn't that what he says? You know, I, I've sinned against thee and no more willing to be called thy son, right? It, he's going to him and what is he doing? He's repenting for what he had done. It's not repenting of your sins. That's not what's going on. You know, that phrase is not mentioned in regards to these types of concepts. It's just saying, I've done wrong. That's actually what it is. Admit, just like when you get saved, what do you do? You admit that you're a sinner. You're admitting that you have done wrong. We're going to see the same exact concept taught here. These are, this is the steps right here, taught by Jesus, in clarity of if there is ever a, 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 an issue or a conflict between two brethren, this right here are the steps to follow. I want you to look at Luke 17, verse number 3. It says this, Take heed to yourselves. So that means this is important. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee. That's just like Jacob and Esau, right? If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. So notice the steps here. Number one, he, has, he, he explains to us the situation of, of what's occurring. He says... If thy brother trespass against thee. What does that mean? He's sinning against you. He's done you wrong, right? He's done something wrong to you. What does he tell you to do? This is what Jesus wants you to do. If someone does you wrong, a brother does you wrong, and obviously this is a serious situation, you need to go to him and you need to sternly correct him. Something very wrong, you need to go to him and you need to rebuke him and say, what you did to me was wrong and it was wicked, right? Right? This is Jesus's, this is his ideal, uh, you know, um, uh, response for a brother that has been done wrong. You need to go to him and you need to rebuke him and watch what it says next. And if he repent, forgive him. Verse 4, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. That is a commandment. It is a commandment that even if your brother <coughs> were to trespass against you, right here it talks about seven times in a day. If your brother did you wrong seven times in a day, and this is obviously a serious situation because Jesus is saying rebuke him. If he did you very wrong, did something extremely wrong to you seven times in one day, you are commanded as a Christian to forgive him. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Now if that makes you uncomfortable, too bad. Because that's what the Bible says. If you have a brother that sins against you seven times in a day, he says, thou shalt, thou shalt forgive him. That's not optional. Kind of like thou shalt not bear false witness. You know what that means? This is a commandment. Thou shalt forgive him. Now, I understand that that can be difficult. I get that. If somebody really does you wrong, I mean, we're all human and everybody understands that can be very, very hard. But we need to obey God's commandments. We need to, you know, do everything that we can in our power to follow the commandments of God and follow the, the law of the Lord. And what does he tell us to do? Thou shalt forgive him. Now, there's two ditches on both sides. There's the ditch over here where the person just doesn't forgive. 
Right? They're not willing to forgive. The brother's going to him and saying, I repent. I've done you wrong. Can I find grace in your eyes, please? Will you forgive me? That's a ditch on this side where he says, thou shalt forgive him. But then there's also a ditch on the other side. Look again at verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And then it says this, and if he repent, forgive him. What is the word if? What, what, what uh, uh, concept does it entail? That there is a condition here, right? It is conditional. I want you to notice it says rebuke him and if, if he repent, if he repent, forgive him. What does that mean? He says if he repents, forgive him. The if is not just random. You know, it means something. What does it mean? That, let, me, let me explain to you. If he repents. It's conditional upon what? Repentance. So, he, he needs to repent and say, I repent. Now, that's exactly what happens. That is the repentance in the next verse. He says, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So if your brother comes to you and says, hey, I know that I've done you wrong, or hey, can I find grace in your eyes? Right? I'm sure there was more said by Jacob to Esau, but it was clear he was trying to find mercy. He's asking for grace. That means that he had done wrong. That's what that means. When you need grace, you're asking, please don't give me what I deserve. Right? I need, be gracious to me. Don't give me what I have coming to me, right? So there needs to be a repentance. And, and here's the thing, the, the relationship will not establish uh, otherwise. Because there's a couple of problems that, that can occur if there, if there is not repentance. Number one, what can happen is uh, that person will, you're, you're, you're not helping them. Let me word it that way. You're not helping them if they have, have sinned against you and done an extremely major sin against you or trespass against you in an extreme way. You're not helping them by just saying, all right, and not having them face it, not having them bring it up again. No, it helps them. They need, if, you know, people just shouldn't be able to just go around and treat people like crap and you know, uh, sin against people all the time, steal things from people, and then just never have to face up to it right? That's not okay. So there needs to be a repentance. You are causing this person to just feel like they can just walk all over people without ever having to face up for what they've done wrong. Not only that, what can happen is you may reestablish a relationship with a person and think, and in your mind you're like, well they know what they did was wrong to me. It's behind us, but it just never gets brought up. You know what happens? Two to three years later, you start talking about it and they're like, what are you talking about? And they maybe did something extremely wrong to you, right? And they're like, what are you talking about? And, they're, and you're like, man, what you did was terrible. And they're like, that wasn't, that wasn't that big of a deal. What I did to you, hey, and what is that going to do? You think you're going to be okay with that? No, of course not. If someone sins against you, you they, they need, there needs to be repentance there, just like with God. There needs to be repentance there. So this is, th there's two ditches here. It's very clear that it's a commandment. Thou shalt forgive him. It's not optional. It is a commandment to forgive him. But what is the condition on forgiving him? What does it say? If he repent, forgive him. That's the commandment. It's, it's, it's very clear that it is 100% conditional and it is both a commandment. So we can err either way here. You can err by being hard-hearted and not willing to forgive your brethren, and he's trying to reestablish the relationship. But then also you can err by just not, never bringing it up to your brother, never rebuking him. You are told to bring it up to your brother if he sins against you. Now, hopefully he comes to you and tells you, right? But if, if he tries to come back to you, you need to bring it up to him. Word it that way. Hopefully he would say, hey, I know what I did was wrong, you know, I, you know I, can I find grace in your eyes? Will you forgive me for this? However he wants to word it. But if not, if he ever tries to come to you and say, hey, you know, do you want to go get some dinner sometime? You need to, say, you need to correct him and say, hey, you know, what you did, what, did to me was wrong and you need, to, you need to admit what you did was wrong. You need to apologize to me or at least stand to it and tell me I repent. There needs to be some sort of repentance. That's what Jesus teaches here, that there needs to be repentance. So notice, there's a ditch on each side. And this is very important to understand because most Christians do not even understand that the Bible teaches this. And they have this weird type of idea of Christianity where you just forgive everybody for everything, no matter what. That's not biblical. 
That's not biblical. It is a commandment. If he repent, if he repent, forgive him. That is as plain as day, my friend. That's super clear. Amen. That is, it's not a biblical teaching, and you're not being like, like hyper gracious or hyper merciful. You are misunderstanding this commandment right here. If he repent, forgive him. It's extremely obvious. It's, it's, it's conditional. Hey, but you know what? You should not have a hard heart or be bitter. Like, why isn't he coming to me to ask for forgiveness, right? That, that, shouldn't be, that shouldn't be your attitude either way. Because when he gets to you, you're just going to be like, ha, ha, ha. You know, that's not the right, that's not good. You shouldn't, and you're going to be the type of person in the future probably that's like holding it over his head. Right? That's not the attitude. You should be hoping that he comes to you and that, he, and you should be wanting and desiring to establish a relationship. You know a perfect example? Esau. When you, when you kind of step back and then you look at what happened, it's, it is, it's profound. 20 years went by, I didn't see him for a very long time. He stole his blessing and Esau knew what that blessing meant. You saw the grief and the sorrow that Esau had. But when his brother came back, forgot totally about it, didn't he? To forgive means to forget. I don't have the verse in front of me, but Jeremiah defines it very clearly. There's a few different times in the Bible that you can define it as. You know, forgiving is forgetting. That is the definition according to uh, the Bible and according to God's forgiveness. So we should, when, when we get <coughs> forgiveness to someone, we should totally forget about what they had done. Amen. That is true forgiveness and not just hold it over their head. You know, and then when they, they do wrong, something wrong again in the future, maybe you do them wrong, you're like, you're like, yeah, remember what you did to me? Well, you didn't truly forgive them, right? You need to really and honestly forgive from your heart. We need to have the right heart, right, with this type of situation. We need to love our brethren. Go back to Genesis chapter number 33. We need to love our brethren. Amen. We need to forgive our brethren, when they, even when they do us wrong. You know how many times? Seven times. Seventy times seven. If you compare this passage, that's 490 times. Even if 400... What was that? Oh, you're talking to... Gotcha. Yeah, so even if 490 times, if your brethren were to tre trespass against you in a day, in one day, you should be able to forgive your brethren. If you, if you compare Scripture to Scripture, all the Gospels, you know, the, they, they have Jesus, you know, he'll be preaching the same story, you know, a few different times. You can compare them and learn things. So there it was, it was seven times a day. Another one is 490, 70 times seven. That's extreme. But that's the type of forgiveness that Jesus asked for us to have for our brethren. But it doesn't need to be, it can't be a shallow forgiveness. There has to be repentance there. Like Jacob, what type of heart did he have? He had a, he had a, a gracious, humble heart, didn't he? And he knew that he had done wrong. And it was obvious that he, he repented. Isn't that obvious? Extremely obvious. So this is a great example of a brother forgiving another brother. And I mean, Esau was extremely upset to the point where he was in his heart saying he was going to kill him. I mean, that's, that is, you know, he, was, he had a lot of anger there. He totally forgot about it. And he was just happy to see his brother. He was happy to see his brethren. Right? We should have the same attitude with our brethren, our spiritual family. Amen. Look there at verse number uh, 12. And he said, Let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. <coughs> Excuse me. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. Now, like I said, uh, I pointed out in, uh, I believe, the past two or three chapters right in a row, we can see a lot of qualities of leadership that Jacob is uh, demonstrating or illustrating here. And we see this again, where... He, he, of course, is able to execute this situation perfectly. He's, he's strategizing. He's got a plan A, a plan B, all of those different types of things. He's sending the gifts. He's being a leader for his family. Uh, here we see <coughs> Esau you know, uh, presenting an option, and, and, and Jacob is, is uh, he's man enough to stand up and say, hey, we're not able to do that. Not only that, he's looking out for all of his, right? And he understands the weaknesses and the strengths of the children, of the animals. Like there in verse number 14, he says, Hey, if I, if I push them you know, through the day and through the night and try to keep up with you guys, you know, he says uh, there at the end, 
Uh, in verse 13, I'm sorry, and if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. So he understands the weaknesses and the strengths. He's being a good leader, right? He's, he's, he knows the, the, the boundaries of his flocks, and he's also, he also talks about his children. You know, the children are tender. These are qualities that a man should have of being a good leader. You need to be able to identify the strengths and the weaknesses if you're in a situation of being a leader. And you need to be able to make decisions like this of the boundaries of a person. You know, like when you're working on a job, if you're the lead of whatever project or a job that you're on, you need to know the strengths and the weaknesses so you can say, hey, you know, you will not be able to efficiently do this job. I need you over here. And then you, you know, you have this weakness, so I need you over here. So we can see further how this correlates with him being a leader and, and also him standing up to Esau and, and, and explaining to him, hey, we're not going to be able to do that. It's not a good idea. Not only that, look at verse number 15. It says, <coughs> and uh, Jacob, and Esau, I'm sorry, Esau, and Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So notice he's still referring to him as uh, his Lord, right? And of course, this is Lord like sir or like boss, like a landlord. You know, our landlord is the boss of, of, of this building, right? So that is, that is the, she's the boss here. And in this case, Esau is referring to uh, Jacob. I'm sorry, Jacob is referring to Esau like he is his boss. Why? Because he's showing great humility still. Yeah. Now, this is interesting. I don't have this in my notes at all, uh, but... <clears throat> The situation with Jacob and Esau, of course, Jacob established the nation of Israel, right? And Esau established the nation of Edom. Now, there is a, uh, a prophecy that is quoted. Go to Romans chapter number 11 and we'll look at this. There's a prophecy that is often quoted by Calvinist. And uh, <coughs> it's found here... I'm sorry, 9, chapter 9. I don't know why I said 11. Romans chapter number 9. <clears throat> I, was, I thought I was debunking the Zionists for a minute. Romans chapter number 9. So Romans chapter number 9, uh, there is, I believe it's verse like 10. <coughs> Look at verse 11. It says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that, call, that, but of him that calleth, it says in verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now who is the elder? <coughs> Who's the oldest? Esau, right? So that leaves the younger being who? Jacob, right? Now people will uh, uh, quote this passage, people that are Calvinist, and they will believe that this is teaching. They will, they will take you to this particular passage right here. And, uh, and they will try to to cause you to believe that the Bible is talking about personal salvation and that God is speaking about the individual Esau and the individual Jacob. And what Calvinism teaches is that God, you know, uh, that He predestined as in He chose beforehand who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. And that these people had no say in the matter and that man, of course, they reject the idea of free will. They will use this passage to say that this applies to the person Jacob and to the person Esau. And that Jacob went to heaven and that Esau went to hell. And they'll say, verse 12, It was said unto her, The elder <coughs> shall serve the younger. Verse 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And then they'll say, see, God loves Jacob, but he hates Esau. And how will they apply this? They'll apply it to the person Jacob and to the person Esau. Well, if you look up this quotation, we're going to look this up right now because we're almost done right now anyways, but this is applicable at this point. I'm going to point out why, and there's a good chapter that you can go to, to to show this. Go to Malachi chapter number 1. Malachi chapter number 1. It's always important to look up passages when they're quoted because then you can figure out what it's talking about because they're trying to get you to believe that, it's talk, that God is saying that He hates the person Jacob and that He hates the person Esau. But that's not at all what is being spoken here. The nation of Israel is oftentimes called what? Jacob. The nation of Edom is oftentimes called what? Esau. We're going to see that right here in Malachi chapter number 1. <coughs> Look at verse number 1. We'll just begin reading there. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. So who is he speaking to? 
Israel. It's talking about the nation. Of course, this is many years the minor prophet. This is many years after Jacob, the person, and Esau, the person, have lived and they're dead and gone. Look at verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. Watch this. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Keep reading. Verse number 4. Whereas, so as a result of that, Edom saith. Now what is Edom? It's a nation. Notice how he went back and forth while he's talking about Esau. Then he goes back and he's, he's, he calls Esau what? Edom. So at the time that he destroyed you know, Esau's uh, mountains and his heritage, look at verse 4. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. Now is that one person speaking? That's more than one person. That's because it's a nation. We are impoverished, but we will return and build the des desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indi indignation forever. So notice it says, the people. So you know what it's talking about? It's talking about a nation. It's talking about a nation of people. So when you look up the passage of actually when he says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, he explains to you at the time in which he, this applies, when he hated him, he says, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste. So he's destroying the land of Esau. Then at that time still, after he's destroyed it, he says that the people say to him, right after that, we're going to build the desolate places, right? They say, they, they, shall, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness. So it is about, is this, when this is quoted, is it directed at the person Esau? No, he's clearly speaking about many years, hundreds, thousands, you know, uh, it'd be over a thousand years later when he destroys the land of Esau or the land of Edom. Jacob, many times in the Bible, is just talking about the nation of Israel. That's why here in verse 1 and verse 2, he uses Jacob and Israel interchangeable. That's why in verse number 2 and 3, I'm sorry, Verse 3 and 4, he uses Esau and Edom interchangeable. You know why? Because when you look up the passage, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. He's, taught, he's saying this, Israel have I loved, Edom have I hated. Right. Proof's in the pudding. Where's the passage from? It's from, a pa it's from a particular context wherein he is talking about the judgment. When did he hate them? He says, I, w I laid their, their heritage and their uh, lands waste and desolate. And then they respond to that. And it's people speaking to him, saying we. So is it specifically about the man Esau and the man Jacob? No, it's not. Further proof of that is, go back to Romans 9 if you turn from there. It says in verse 12, <coughs> we read this, It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And then it says, as it is written. So... When we look up the passage, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau have I hated, when is it quoted? Many, many years later. So when does the elder serving the younger take place? Many, many years later. Why do I point this out right now? Go back to Genesis. With that in mind, go back to Genesis 33. Genesis chapter 33. It said, the elder shall serve the younger. Well, this will just be further proof of that. <clears throat> That would, if you would try to apply this personally to Jacob and to Esau, then that, me, that would mean that the elder would be serving the younger. Who is the elder? Esau. And who is the younger? Jacob. That means we would be able to look at the lives of Jacob and Esau and who would be serving who? Esau would be serving who? Jacob. Okay? Look at verse 15, just as an example. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, Who's he? Jacob. What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So does this sound like Jacob, like Esau is serving Jacob? No. You cannot point to a single time in the life of Jacob and Esau, the individuals where Esau served Jacob. Never happened. One time ever. And when you look up the passage of when it's quoted, it's clearly in context talking about the nations. Romans chapter number 9, in context, you don't have to go back there, but I'm going to read to you, in context it says this, verse 6. So just a few verses up. Now, not as the word of the Lord hath taken none effect, 
For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. So what's it talking about in context? The nation of Israel. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, saying the children of the flesh of Abraham, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So what's it talking about in context? The nation of Israel. That is as plain as the nose on your face. Right? It's extremely plain. And Calvinists will try to jerk this out of context and try to make you believe that God hated the person Esau. You know, and that he hated the individual. And Now, let me clarify this as well. People think God loves everyone. That's not true. That's not true. I can show you numerous passages in the Bible where God says, I hate them. I hate those people. Many, many times the Bible will say that God hates people. That's the God of the Bible. You don't make up your own, you don't get to make up your own imaginary God. God is who He is. And if God hates people, God hates people. You have to believe it, right? You know, that's just what the Bible teaches. And sometimes things in the Bible can be, they can, it can be a hard pill to swallow, right? But the Bible talks about God hating people. That's not why I'm, I'm arguing against this point. So I want to, want to clarify that. But the Bible does not teach that God just, you know, basically out of his own mind, it's not based on the person, nothing that they do, his own choice. He just, pre, he just chooses beforehand, not based on the individual at all, I just hate you. And this person, I just happen to love you. You know the people that God hates in the Bible? He hates wicked people. If you would have been reading right there, he was talking about how he hated a nation. Do you know why? He said they're going to be known as the borders of wickedness. Do you know why? Because they were wicked. That's why. Because they were evil. You know the type of people that God hates? Wicked people. Extremely evil people to the core. God does not love everyone. You know, you know, God, here, let me, say, let me uh, clarify even a little bit further. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Every single individual that has ever been, been born, God loved them. But that does not mean that God continues to love them while you know, people change, right? And they can become monstrous, wicked, evil, evil, dark people to the soul, right? And can hate God. And that's the type of person every time when the Bible talks about God hating someone, every time it's always talking about a wicked person. Amen. Every time. What is it? Psalm 5? Does anybody remember? I believe it's Psalm 5. Is that right? I might waste your time. Go to Psalm 5. Let's look at this verse. <clears throat> What's that? Is it 11? Maybe it's 11.5. That could be what it is. Yeah. Go to, go to uh, Psalm chapter number 11 then. Brother Hall. I like Brother Hall telling us where it's at anyway, so if it's a mistake then I can say it was Brother Hall. <clears throat> Look at uh, verse number 5. That's why I thought it was chapter 5. <coughs> so I can kind of take credit for that still. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Psalm chapter number 11, verse number 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and look at this, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Read that four or five times if you need to. I'll read it for you again. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hated. Now, let me say this. A person that is saved, God will never hate you. Amen. The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you can never be out of Christ Jesus. Jesus clearly said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You will forever be in Christ if you are saved, right? But the Bible teaches that there are people that will go down a road of complete and absolute and utter wickedness and will just do unspeakable things. People like disgusting serial killers, right? That are just, they're just monsters. This is the point where they're not even human beings. They're, they're, you know, they're doing all types of just grotesque things that should not, ought not even be spoken to human beings. Just horrible things. Those type of people that just eat, you know, they eat the bread of wickedness, the Bible says. They eat and sleep sin and just darkness and they love it. Those people hate God, and the Bible says that God hates them. Amen. That is the God of the Bible. Amen. That is the God of the Bible. The, you know, the God of the Bible says, those that show themselves unsavory to me, he says, I'll show myself unsavory to them. Right. You want to be froward to me? He says, I'll be froward to you. That is the God of the Bible. Amen. You know, People want this just like Santa Claus God. Well, that's not the God of the Bible, my friend. Right. You know, The God of the Bible is not just this pushover parent 
where you got to go to bed at 10 o'clock and you're up at midnight. That, it doesn't work like that. God has commandments and God, and, and those that are Christians, God will punish you. Right. And God will chasten you. If, you. if you get outside of His will, you're going to get a spanking from the God of the Bible. And those that are not saved, they can get way, way, way away from salvation, way away from righteousness. They can go down this just horrible path and they can get to the point where God hates them. That's a scary place to be. That is an extremely scary place to be. Where you're such a wicked person where the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, all power and all might would look at a person and say, I hate you. That's scary. That's extremely fearful. You know what? But it's... it's Back, kind of back to where we were before. <coughs> it's not because God just says, oh, I hate you and I love you. And it's not based upon anything because I just chose this before the foundations of the world. That's not the God of the Bible. It's based upon your actions and your life and the way that you live. Right? That is a, a, why God would hate a person because of their great wickedness. That's according to Psalm chapter number 11, verse number 5. Right? Go back to Genesis chapter number 33. Genesis chapter number 33. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 33. <coughs> so we can see that Esau here, that Jacob is actually, in a sense, serving Esau. So it's the exact opposite. We can see him calling him Lord. We can see him showing him kindness. Again, tell this to the black Hebrew Israelites, right? She's heard, they've heard, been here for both services. So she's probably wondering why I keep mentioning that. There's a battle going on online where people are, you know. Right? So, there, you know, there's this group of people, uh, African Americans in the United States of America today, that say that they are the true Israelites. And that is ridiculous, and it is stupid, and guess what? It doesn't matter. Right. Even if you were, like I preached Sunday morning, it doesn't help you any. Even if you were of the nation of Israel today, physically... You know what John the Baptist would tell you? Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You know how much it helps you? Zilch. It doesn't mean crap. It means nothing at all, period. So, even if they were, that wouldn't help them at all. And what they say is, you know, uh, this is just scientifically, this is, it's, it's, you know, humor me for a minute. This is literally what they teach. This is literally what they teach. Rebecca and Isaac had twins. They had children. And Jacob was a black man. And Esau was a white man. That's exactly what they teach. Now, if you think that that's genetically possible, listen to me. You are a complete and absolute fool. Right. That is ridiculous. That is utter nonsense. That is complete stupidity. Do you hear me? Amen. And now if you think, oh, you're being a little bit harsh. Now these people, these people are very wicked, evil people. A lot of them are extremely evil. And you know what? It has nothing to do with the color of their skin right. at all, period. You know what it has to do with? Just their wickedness. Their righteousness or their wickedness, right? You know, they're the ones that, that make everything, tr they try to make this about it being a race. And in the first place, like I showed in, uh, in, in, the, in the Sunday morning sermon, the nation of Israel wasn't a race. It was a nation. Newsflash. It was a nation. People became Jews. They became Jews. You could not become a Jew if it was, a ne it was an ethnicity, you fool. You could not become a Jew. You think I could just, today I'm white. I'm going to become black. You stinking moron. You can't do that, obviously. You know what I could do, though? I could go today. I wouldn't want to do this, but the physical nation of Israel, I could become an Israelite. I could become a Jew in that sense, right? That is what happened in Esther 8, 17. So, it was not an ethnicity. It was not a race in the first place. It was a nation, a nation, right? And Israel established one nation, and Esau established the other nation. And, and, and the black Hebrew Israelites, they try to teach that they are supposed to, and they are commanded to hate Esau. That they, that, 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 we, that they should hate Esau. Go to Deuteronomy real quick. We're just, we're just going to take care of this right now. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter number 23, and just show you how ignorant these people are when it comes to the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 7. Let me ask you this question. Did it look like Jacob hated Esau there? No, he was like serving him. 
He was bowing down to him. He was asking for grace in his eyes. So did it look like he hated him? No, it looked like he loved him to me and he wanted his forgiveness. That's what it looked like. You know what it looked like? He was treating him like his brother because he was. Amen. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 7. <coughs> now, again, hold on. What, what was the nation of, of, of Esau that came forth from Esau that he established? What was it called? The Edomites. Edomites, right. The, that's right, the Edomites. It's my fellow ancestors. No, I'm just kidding. Look at verse 7. Deuteronomy 23, chapter 23, verse 7. Look at this. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Did you hear that? Thou shalt not abhor. You know what abhor means? Hate. You know what the commandment to an Israelite is? You are commanded, Israel, nation of Israel, O Hebrew, not to hate the Edomites. Right. Not to hate those of the tribe of Esau. Amen. So let's play your fairy tale game. Let's say that you are of the nation of Israel. Black Hebrew Israelite. Let's step, step into a fairy tale here for a second. Let's pretend that I'm of the nation of Esau. And I'm an Edomite, right? And you're a black Hebrew Israelite. Guess what? You're commanded to love me, buddy, because I'm your brother. Come kiss me and weep on my neck. Come give me a big hug, you stinking idiot. Why don't you read the Bible every once in a while, you moron? Because they're not interested in the truths of the Bible. They're not interested in actually studying the Bible, understanding the Bible. They have a presupposition, and this is a fact. You know what? There's white people that are the same way. These are a group of black people that just hate whites. And you know what? There are white people that just hate blacks. And guess what? They're both a bunch of stinking morons, and they're ignorant. And here's just the, the, the truth. This is just the facts. It always ends up being the people that are like hyper uneducated. Right, that's right. Both times. Man. Look at all the black people that fall into this. Super uneducated. Right. Don't think I'm being a racist because I'm, uh, I'm not being a respecter of persons. It goes both ways. Guess what? Look at the white people. They're all a bunch of uneducated, ignorant morons. Amen. They're not smart. That, you know, and, and that's just the facts, my friend. That's just the truth. They're just not intelligent people, oftentimes. You know what? This is just the truth, right? And you know what the Bible teaches? That if you are of, even if you were of the nation of Israel, you would be commanded to love your brother, the Esau. You know what that means? You shouldn't care whether somebody's black or white. Amen. You shouldn't care, care whether they're red, they're yellow. You shouldn't care. God does not care. The Bible says, He hath made of one blood all nations. There is no difference. Your skin color matters as much as your eye color. It doesn't matter a tiny bit. Amen. You know, I love a brother and sister that is black or yellow or whatever just as much as I love one that is white. That doesn't matter to me Amen. even a tiny bit. You know what matters is who is of the children of God. That's what matters. You're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we become a true child of God, by faith. So, you know, so what they're te teaching is entirely contrary to the Bible. It's totally... And they're like taking over YouTube. They're like taking over the internet. It is insane. Yeah, but it's to elevate them. That's what it's about. What's that? It's to elevate them. That's what it's about. Oh, of course. I agree with that entirely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, yeah. It's just, it's, it's, what it is is it's, it's, it's carnal. It's fleshly. It's, look at me, it's something they can't even help. Like they, you know, chose to be black. They're just born being black. And then they say that it's just this amazing, great thing. Look at me. You know, like uh, uh, Solomon's wife said, I am black, right? That's not what she meant. They're not just walking around telling people I am black. They're just like, by the way, I am black. That's not what she's saying at all. They're totally un mi uh, misunderstanding that passage. That's ridiculous. You know, and I explained what that meant in that video, obviously. <laughs> it does, the point is it doesn't matter. You know what we should do? Even if my, you know, let's say this. Let's say, hey, you know, black people were of the Israelites and white people were, were of Edom. If both were children of God, they should love one another. Amen. Treat, treat, hey, all those of, of Israel, you need to treat the Edomite with love. All those of Esau, 
You need to treat the Israelite with love. Amen. We should all love each other. All the children of God, we should love each other. And we should not pay attention to skin color. Amen. It shouldn't matter at all. Right. It doesn't matter even a tiny bit. If you, if you do a study on your ancestry, you'd find out that you're just like this mixed, you know, just, you are just a mutt. You right. just come from everywhere, right? Everybody is like that. Everybody. Amen. There's no, like, like, you know, precious like Aryan blood and there is no like precious Israelite blood. Even Jesus was born of Moab. He was born of Moab. It doesn't matter at all. You know, God wouldn't have allowed a Mo Moabite blood to get in there if it mattered. The Messiah came also of the nation of Moab. Do you know what that tells me? Doesn't matter to God. Not even a tiny bit. Doesn't matter to God. You know what? So you know what that means? It shouldn't matter to you. Amen. Shouldn't matter to you. We need to love all of our brothers. You know who we should, you know who we should you know, exalt and care about the most? The children of God. And we should love our brethren. Right? That's who we should love. Just like Jacob loved Esau and Esau loved Jacob. Right? And he was willing to forgive him. Go back to Genesis chapter number 33 and we'll end here. Genesis chapter number 33. <clears throat> It's been on my mind a little bit lately, so. Genesis chapter number 33. <coughs> uh, look there at verse number 16. It says, So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. So that's related to the fact that he built the booths. Verse 18, And Jacob... Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram, and pitched his tent before the city. That's talking about Shechem, the city of Shechem. Verse 19, And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Elohi. Israel. Now, uh, you'll know here in verse number 34, <coughs> I want you to, because sometimes these, these, I'm sorry, chapter number 34, you'll notice if you kind of glance over the beginning there, this is actually the situation that occurs with Dinah, right, where uh, she goes and she commits uh, fornication with the man of, uh, of, uh, of uh, in Shechem, right, in the city of Shechem. Right up there in, in uh, verse number 18, this is actually setting up for that. It says in verse 18, And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem. So that's where they are located right now. It's the city of Shechem. Uh, he's setting up shop here, and then that situation or that incident with Dinah, his, his uh, daughter, the only daughter that he had, is going to occur in the next chapter. So we'll pick up reading there next Wednesday. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this night, dear Lord. We